and thank you, Tracy. I concur Mark's comments about this uh, conference and what you've achieved here again for the fifth year, uh, and I'd like to see you keep going. Now, I'm going to compress into 10 minutes or 15 minutes, if I'm allowed, 15 years of very, very hard work on the, what we call the Dubbo Zirconia Project. And as you see when I get into it, it really isn't just a Zirconia Project. So just a little snapshot on Alkane first, in case you don't know us. We're an ASX OTC listed company. We are totally focused with one region within, within the, uh, what we call the central west of the state of New South Wales in Eastern Australia. We are a multi-commodity company, so we don't believe in just being single-minded about gold, base metals, rare earths, rare metals. We have a multi-commodity approach to, to our operations, and that's why we're still doing very, very well today. Um, that's just a bit of a snapshot, so the top there is our first half-year uh, 2016 financials. Uh, we generate a substantial cash flow from our gold operations, we're making a profit. Most of that money is being channelled back into what we as I said, call the Dubbo Zirconia project, the DZP, to advance it to a point now where it's ready to go into construction. And so the rest of the talk I'm really going to focus on the DZP. So DZP, as I said, located in that central west region, it's about 400 kilometres from Sydney. It's an area of major agricultural uh, development activity. It also has some major mines. And down in the bottom corner, which I'm not sure I can see, down there, is the Cadia Operations of Newcrest. It's one of Australia's largest open-cut underground gold copper mines. So it's in part of the same region. The nice thing about this region to operate is it's got all the infrastructure. It's got roads, railways, gas pipeline, water, and major power infrastructure. And our electric, electric, electricity charges in that region are very, very low, some of the lowest in the world. The project itself, a very, very large resource of those metals, zirconium, hafnium, niobium, tantalum, yttrium and rare earths. And as a resource, it's got an open pit life of probably 80 to 100 years. We've got a second deposit nearby, which has a similar resource potential, which we haven't bothered to even explore at this stage, really because why do you explore when you've got something that's going to last 100 years to start with anyway? We've spent a lot of time developing a flow sheet. I'm not going to talk about the resource, but just focus on the, on the flow sheet and the products that we're going to produce. Uh, and we are, and we have been using and working with ANSTO, uh, um, Adrian mentioned them before. Uh, basically, they are Australia's premier research facility. And we've developed a commercial and technically viable flow sheet with them, particularly over the last eight years, and running a large-scale demonstration pilot plant. There's the flow sheet. In a snapshot, it's just a sulfuric acid leach process. It's a whole of ore process. We crush and grind the rock, we mix it with sulfuric acid, we heat it up, and then we rinse it effectively with water. And at that point, all of the metals that we want all go into solution. And then we have various stages of solvent extraction, chemical precipitation, separation, to produce a suite of products. And if I start at the top right and come down, you can see ZBC, which is zirconium basic carbonate, a zirconia, a ZRO2, which we derive from that. And we also can make advanced zirconia products like mixing with yttria to produce yttria stabilised zirconias. Now that product coming off the zirconium stream currently is about 99.9% ZR or ZRO2. It's very close to nuclear grade. I don't think anybody else has ever done that in a solvent extraction plant anywhere in the world. Uh, and it's something that we've really mastered over eight years of running that pilot plant. In the last two years, we decided to go back and look at hafnium. Hafnium normally reports with zirconium. Normally our products would have hafnium in it. The growing interest in uh, the aerospace industry and industrial gas turbines for hafnium in special alloys made us go and look at it. And we can actually now also produce a hafnium oxide product, uh, which we're looking to refine further to, to use in, in special alloys. We also produce a, a ferro-niobium product. We're working in partnership with Tribarker on that, the Austrian company. Uh, and they basically will look after all of the marketing and sales of the, uh, of the ferro -niobium. On the rare earths, simplistically, what we produce is a rare earth concentrate on site. It's about 95 to 98 per cent REO. Uh, we actually produce a chloride, and the reason we produce a chloride is more for the downstream applications of where it goes than any other specific reason. And you can see on the very right hand side, the current flow sheet has what is planned on site. In this case, we'll remove lanthanum cerium. We see no value in uh, extracting lanthanum cerium commercially at this stage. 
uh, to, to, to sail, the, the, the cost of freighting from Australia basically are worth more or cost more than the value of the raw material at this stage. We also will extract yttrium on site, and the reason for that is we can use yttrium in our zirconium products, as I mentioned, yttria stabilise zirconias, and also we have yttrium markets in the uh, ceramic industry. The central group of rare earths, and this includes both light and heavy earths, uh, basically will go off to our toll processing uh, partner, which I'll mention in a moment. So the, the project is basically built around it being a polymetallic or multi-metal project, and, it's, and you'll see in a moment, it's a very, very robust financially because of that reason. So on our product output, so this is from site. We produce that rare earth concentrate I mentioned, as a conium products, the hafnium product as a concentrate, and then ferro niobium. On the hafnium, I will add here that the uh, current market, I don't have time to go into all the, all the detail on that, but uh, the current market is about 70 to 80 tonnes a year of hafnium metal. Uh, at our basic startup process, we could produce 200 tonnes a year. So you can see we have a, a market dilemma there. Uh, but our initial concept is to start at about 50 tonnes per year. So, not too far. So, go back. So this is the rare earth circuit. So from site, on the left hand side, you see the, what we call the rare earth concentrate. Lanthanum serum removed on site, uterine removed on site all the other, other rare earths, and we do have the full spectrum of rare earths. This isn't just a particularly a light rare earth project or a heavy rare earth project. All the other rare earths go down to our partner. Uh, they get toll processed and separated. And you can see the distribution. I'm not going to rattle them off there. But the four most key metals amongst all of those are the magnet metals, the ones that go into making the permanent magnets, praseodymium, neodymium, and then further down, terbium and dysprosium. All of the numbers that I'm showing you, all these numbers have been generated from operation of our pilot plant, which has been going for eight years. So these are mass balance, real numbers, real recoveries. They're not figments of our imagination. They are real numbers, that, and these are the actual volumes and tonnages that we will produce. On other off-take agreements, I mentioned before, we had an agreement with Tribarker in Austria to take all of our ferro niobium and market it. Um, we are Sorry, we are very close to uh, producing, a, a, announcing a sales and marketing agreement for all of our zirconium product, and that should be completed sometime in the next two weeks or three weeks. The off-site processing for rare earths I've mentioned, and we're in deep discussions with many end users around the world. We've been doing that now for four or five years on all of the output and all of the products that we produce. And just going back to that, that matter of the zirconium, as I said, the fact that we can produce now very, very high purity zirconium uh, takes us up a value from the basic normal zirconia products that one might see involved in the ceramics or refractory industry. We'll actually produce something that's significantly greater than that. Our partner, our partner on the rare earth uh, processing is a company called Vietnam Rare Earth, uh, based just outside of Hanoi. They've been operating since 2012. Uh, they have a very up-to-date, state-of-the-art uh, processing plant, about 4,000 tonnes a year, producing separated rare earths. And they have markets which they are currently selling into Asia. So they've got certified products they're selling into Asia. They've also recently built a metal plant at Haiphong, uh, down the main port city, and they're producing a number of rare earth metals, again, at certified quality and selling them into the Asian market. And the next strategic plan on top of that is to go the full hog and build uh, a rare earth magnet plant. They are, surprisingly, uh, you might think Vietnam's a very um, third world country, and it is overall, but they have some very highly sophisticated uh, technical operations in, in Vietnam. Samsung, the giant Korean company, has an investment of about 13 to $15 billion US into both a mobile phone plant and a television plant. Uh, and obviously they work on the basis of the cost structure there is very, very favourable. And on the bottom you can see the note I've left there. The cost structure in Vietnam, both capital cost and operating cost, is less than China. So for us today, producing our raw material of, uh, on site at Dubbo, we can actually go back to the market by selling rare earth, separated rare earth products and alloy separated alloy products at less than currently what are being supplied by China. So a little snapshot, I said I don't really have time to go into great detail. Um, very diverse markets, very uh, great applications across the board in new technologies and clean technologies, 
uh, zirconium used in auto cats, of course, uh, thermal barrier coatings on turbines, right down through to ultimately to, to cubic zirconia jewellery. Hafnium, fascinating metal. Uh, its demand has been limited by its supply. Well, that's a pretty strange statement, I know, but basically um, the supply has been limited, so the demand has really hasn't been able to get get going. Our discussions with the industrial companies for, for industrial gas turbines and aerospace indicates that when Dubbo comes on stream, there's substantial applications that, that can be expanded into. And many other things happening in the hafnium world. Niobium, we know basically steels, and the rare earth sector I really won't go into a in great detail at this stage. What is important? Financials. We've completed a detailed feed study, front end engineering and design study, so the plant's about 30% fully detailed design. We ran the economics again in August of last year, we run them regularly. And the pie chart you can see shows our revenue distribution according to output. I should say that the prices here that are used, these are current spot Chinese prices. There's no escalators on this, um, no escalators from rare earth, no future escalations. Niobium price is the current Niobium price, zirconium price is the current zirconium price. Haftim one's a little bit difficult because the Haftim spot market is currently $1,200 to $1,500 a kilo. We've picked a number around $800 as a long-term sustainable price. So you can see the economics. Yes, it's nearly a billion dollar project, uh, but the revenue stream it generates, the cost structure it's got, it's a very substantial cash generating project. It has an NPV today of about 1.2 or 1.3. US billion dollars. I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, the the, the uh, presentation will be available uh, both on Alkane's website and I'm sure elsewhere afterwards. But to find, finish up on DZP Advantage, what we call the DZP Advantage, the key advantage is this polymetallic nature. So we do not rely on one particular spectre of our output like rare earths. We don't rely on heavy rare earths. As you saw in the pie chart earlier, the distribution of revenue is spread throughout the project and really it, uh, and its cost structure, it makes it a substantial and very viable project. What I do want to leave you with, apart from no, uh, mentioning the, uh, the disclaimer that one has to do these days, but the last one, which I think is a very, very pathetic st statement, uh, is Alkane today the only, only rare earth company uh, generating a profit? Thank you.